Are you all ready to study the scriptures together today? Man, I'm so glad that you are excited because I am too. And uh, we're going to be talking about the testimony of our comfort. It's going to be coming straight from 2 Corinthians from the letter that Paul had. And let's just start right with it. Uh, verse 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. I'm going to stop right there uh, for a second. I'm going to tell you, Paul was dealing with some real problems, some real afflictions that not only had addressed him, but it addressed and were plaguing the church there in Corinth. But what I think is so amazing is some people, when they have problems, they want to stop and just talk about the problems. And they lead off with the problems. What's amazing about Paul is he starts with the solution before he ever starts talking about the problems. And so first off, we know we got problems. He knows he has problems. They've got problems. They're living it every single day. But one thing they're going to do to start it off with is we're going to bless God. And that's what I love about praise and worship. We come in here with hurts and we come in here with pains and we come in here with anxieties and we come in here with afflictions, but we are going to start. We're going to start our gathering together blessing the creator of heaven and earth. And that's exactly what Paul did. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Because that's exactly who he is. And before we're going to deal with our problems, we've got to know something more. We've got to understand our God and who he is, the God of, of all comfort. It's a, amazing to me. Jesus said before, that he, before he left his disciples that I'm going to send you a comforter, <laughs> the God of all comfort, someone that's going to comfort us with all the afflictions with which we're going to be faced. And, the, and so we wonder what it is, what is it that God does to bring comfort? Number one, he, he brings us his presence. You are not alone. And I'm going to tell you, every time you start feeling down, you start feeling excluded, you start feeling isolated, I'm going to tell you something. we got good news. The God of all comfort makes sure you will never be alone. It's his presence. It's the presence of his Holy Spirit that dwells in us. No matter what you're going through, his presence is there. And not only his presence, but his promises will come true. And his promises are in his word. So when you're down, when you're afflicted, when you're isolated, when you're troubled, when you think that everything is against you, you've got to go to his presence. And when you're in his presence, then you seize upon his promises. Because our God is a promise keeper. Amen. Amen. So I want us to talk about this experience that Paul um, spoke about. He, he spent 18 months in Corinth, a town over in, in Greece, a pagan town, but a town that had a synagogue in it. So the Jews really had spread out over the hundreds of years before Jesus even lived. There were Jewish synagogues in all of these Greek towns, or at least in the largest ones. And Paul, as he always did, he started teaching in the synagogue, and he taught in the synagogue every Sabbath until there were some Jewish people who were unbelievers who rejected his testimony that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah, the Christ that they had waited for, for all of these thousands, or, you know, 1,400 years at least from the law of Moses. And so after he was rejected and kind of pretty much pushed out of the synagogue, he started teaching in house churches. In fact, there was a house church right next to the synagogue. So instead of just saying, hey, why don't you all go to the synagogue, why don't you come on into this house? And so he would start teaching people, and that's what he did. Until, again, the Jews who were unbelieving didn't like that, and so they went to the local Roman ruler and started trying to stir up the crowds like happened in a lot of these communities, and went before the local ruler. But in this town in Corinth, God made a way, and that, that ruler just, nah, he didn't pay any attention to it. And he says, y'all, I'm not going to get into the middle of this religious discussion. And so Paul kept on preaching. He kept on teaching for a good while, it says, and for at least a total of 18 months. 
And after he left, he went over to Antioch, and then he went over to what was called Asia. We would consider it Asia Minor. So it's not like China Asia. It's Asia in the Roman province where Ephesus was located, and that's where he spent the, really a, a good deal of time after that. And while Paul was there in Ephesus, he began to get bad reports. People that he knew and people that tr he trusted came back with some bad reports about what was going on in Corinth. And it's almost like you, you've got a child and your kids went off to college or, um, and then people kind of in the college town start calling you and say, man, you, your kids got some problems. Is there anything more helpless, helpless feeling is when you're loved one has trouble or, or maybe they call you from out of town and say dad I've got a flat tire and say, I'm, I'm sorry I can't drive five hours I'll, I'll do it but I, it's really, going to be really hard for me to drive five hours you're going to have to learn to deal with it and going to have to deal with people that are there and so Paul he's not going to just leave it alone he started writing letters and we know he wrote several our Bible contains at least two of those letters, 1 Corinthians and then 2 Corinthians. Let's go back to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father. This is how he starts it out. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Verse 4. Who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. So you hear what he's saying? He's saying God, this God is the one who comforts us in our afflictions so that we can comfort those of you who are also in afflictions with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. There's nothing more powerful than what God brings into your life during the afflictions that you experience so that you can then take that experience and the comfort and in, in knowing that God is there with you and know that God's promises are true in your life and despite the afflictions that God has given you a peace and has given you a comfort and now you then take those to others who are going through the same exact things. And so Paul, he really experienced some severe um, afflictions from those who came against his message and and also from people within the church. And Paul talked about these afflictions. He was imprisoned. Five times he was beaten with rods. Beaten. The full extent of a punishment, and that was a Jewish punishment, beating them with rods. Five times. One time he was stoned with rocks and left for dead. Paul was shipwrecked three times, was left in the sea all night long. God saved him, and God protected him, brought him out of the affliction. And Paul talked about in these letters to the Corinthians how he experienced the perils, the dangers of robbers. Can you imagine traveling on those highways and those roads every time you took your, your feet on a journey you put your life at risk because there were bad people out there. But he struggled through the perils of the robbers. He says there were perils from Jews. There were perils from Gentiles. He had perils in the cities. He had perils in the countryside. It seems like everywhere he went, he found these opportunity to grow weary because the afflictions never left him. He was weary and he was in toil and he says he experienced sleeplessness and hunger and thirst and coldness and nakedness and talked about a thorn in the flesh that would not go away even though he begged God to get rid of it out of his life. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. And yet in all of this weakness and all this affliction, God brought him comfort. <laughs> it seems like the, the testimony of our comfort really comes from the ashes of our afflictions. It's true. Paul knew it to be true. 
and he wanted to take that opportunity to share it with this church of people that he loved dearly who was also going through some afflictions of a different kind. Verse 5. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, and he was suffering, he was suffering a lot, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. It seems like the greater your pain, the more comfort means to you, doesn't it? My wife will say, uh, she'll say, what's wrong with you? And I say, I got a little headache. And she says, well, you, let me go get you some, some medicine. I said, oh, no, it doesn't, it's not hurting that bad yet. There's a lot of times that we endure our afflictions because they don't seem to get so bad. But I tell you, when I reach out and I tell her, I said, would you mind going and go get me <laughs> a tyla, two extra think Tylenol? She goes, ooh, you must be hurting. I said, yeah. I need some comfort right now. The greater our afflictions, the more we need comfort. And the more our God will provide it. See, the afflictions from the outside are hard. It's tough when those from the outside are coming against you. I'm going to tell you what's even a greater pain. It was even a greater pain for Paul. It wasn't the afflictions from those out there on the highways and out there on the streets. The afflictions that hurt him the most were the ones that came from the inside of the body of believers that he had labored for as a father, as a mother takes care of their children. It's so much more painful when the afflictions come from those whom you love or you see it in the ones you love. And you know you can't make it go away, but you know the one who can. And Paul talks in the Corinthian letters, he talks about the deep divisions that were in that church. I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of, you know, they were, they were breaking off into groups and all that hurt them. There were those who seemed to be more interested in worldly wisdom. There were those in the church who just were spiritually immature and were lobbying all kind of insults and accusations against Paul, questioning his motives, questioning his authority, questioning his ability and the truthfulness of even the words that he had given them. He's dealing with a church that had arrogance within it. He was dealing with a church that came from a culture of sexual immorality that would make us blush. They had temple prostitutes in these places of worship in these communities. This is where these people lived. And they, that had been their past. That's what they had lived in. And there were people who were trying to come back out of it, but they're getting pulled back into sexual immorality. And Paul is looking at and hearing about these afflictions. In fact, there was a man who was now in, a, in an incestuous relationship with his father's wife. And the church wasn't doing anything about it. There were Christians within the church who were starting to sue each other in legal Roman proceedings. And just afflictions. They were having arguments about food. They were being pulled back into idolatry and the things that they had grown up with. They were abusing and misusing the Lord's Supper. And because of that, there were people who were dying. They had abuse and they surely had misunderstandings of spiritual gifts. They were even having people who were teaching within that church that there was no resurrection. Here Paul's over in Ephesus. And he can't just come in and just say, guys, you're getting all this wrong. He's got to leave it to this letter and to send his, his helpers there. But they had false teachers and they had false apostles. And as they question his motives, he's trying and, and pouring out his heart, pouring out his heart of this affliction and trying to deal with and trying to instruct them and trying to show them because he was so concerned about the churches. Let's go to verse 6. He says, if we are afflicted, 
And he's afflicted. He says, why? It's for your comfort and salvation. The fact that I'm afflicted, the fact that he was upset about all of these long things that were going wrong in the church in Corinth, he says, because I'm afflicted, I'm now bringing you a message that you need to hear about your comfort and about your salvation. If you'll just listen, if you'll just listen, he says here, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we all suffer. Verse 7, For our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you'll also share in our comfort. And Paul's trying to bring them the comfort from a long-distance letter and just praying that God's going to, His Spirit is going to touch these people, that they're going to not only uh, be talking about His afflictions, but they'll start sharing about their own afflictions. And as they start sharing about their own afflictions, they'll start seeing where they need correction. And as they start correcting each other and loving each other and touching each other and living with each other and bringing each other closer into the presence of God and start relying upon the presence of God, and start relying upon the promises of God that salvation is going to come to that church. And because salvation is going to come to that church, salvation is going to come to that community and to that town. See, comfort more is more than just about easing your pain. It's not just about sitting in your lazy boy chair. It's not comfortable. It's not trying to make you comfortable. He's trying to bring you comfort. And that's different. He was trying to bring them an ease to these afflictions that the devil is pummeling them with. And they're only going to pummel it or fight back against it by the presence of God, by the promise of God, and by the prayers of the people. It's a comfort that makes us brave. It's a, a strength in spite of our weakness. And he's saying, y'all need it. Verse 8 says, for we don't want you to be unaware, brethren, of the affliction that we experience in Asia. He says, it's important, it's important for you to know what we've been experiencing over here. For we were utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Paul is still going through some tough times. This great man of God is going through hard times. So don't ever believe a gospel that somebody gives you and says, as soon as you become part, as soon as you become a Christian, all of your troubles are now gone. You get the big house and the big car, and we have wonderful, joyous things all the time. I'm going to tell you, that's not, that's, that's not, that's not, that's not true. And it surely wasn't true in Paul's life, and it's surely not true in the Corinth. And I bet it's not true in your life either. Now, God brings us blessings. Don't, 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 don't get me wrong. He brings blessings in the midst of the affliction that bring us comfort and bring us strength. And through that, the Holy Spirit works in you. And people see it. Verse 9. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Is Paul having a good vacation over in Ephesus? <laughs> How was your trip on your motorcycle? Well, it just felt like death the whole time. Huh? That's, and that, you, know, you were enjoying it. I mean, it's not a time of... of, of it, he is going through the ringer. I was talking about the judge who was on a motorcycle. If you all saw his Facebook post, he was... It's good to see him today this morning. You know, he was enjoying the, the trip. And Indeed, we felt that we'd received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves. Wow. You see that R word there? Rely. Who's he relying on? He's relying upon 
the Father. He's despairing of death, and I'm going to tell you that on which he relies. He's not relying upon what he's been in the past. He's not relying upon his understanding of scriptures. He's not relying on the fact that he has all of this great knowledge. He is relying on one thing to save him and to bring him through the affliction, as that's the Father, the God of all mercies, the God of all comfort. And he's saying, I understand what that feels like. It says, number... number um, it says, but, but I'm going to go back to nine. But that he was to make us rely on ourselves, not on ourselves, but on God who also raises the dead. Verse 10, he delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. Has he delivered you before? Amen. Has he delivered you before? Are there things that God has done in your life and you can say, God delivered me? Well, keep on believing. Keep on knowing that the hope that he's shown you and the goodness and comfort that he's shown you before, he's going to keep showing you. Don't give up on the fact that you're still going through an affliction to say, where did I go wrong? And I'm going to tell you, that's what happens when we get to affliction. We start saying, what did I do wrong? Where did I miss the boat? And there's always some area where in God, that God can show me some correction, but I'm going to tell you the afflictions aren't happening always because I've gotten off the path. They're just the way that the enemy assaults us and the enemy thinks that he's going to cause us to stop relying upon God and having hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to say, in spite of the afflictions, in spite of the things that are going on in our lives, we have got to, we have got to rely upon God. Verse 11 you also must help us by prayer. Man, I need his presence. And I need his promises. But I'm going to tell you what else we need is we need the prayers of the saints. This is Paul speaking. You also must help us by your prayers. If you think prayer doesn't matter, you are wrong. Your prayers matter. They mean something. Because God's taken those pr prayers. And he says, you know what? That brother and that sister, they're relying upon me for a solution. And when you've come to the end of that road where you don't have a solution and you don't have an answer, I'm going to tell you what you do have is you have a father, a God of all comforts who, upon whom you can rely. And we rely upon him by saying, Father, I rely on you. I'm not where I want to be. I'm not where I need to be, but I rely on you. He says, you must also help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Can you can all hear what he's saying here? He's saying, uh, we need these blessings. We need to be pulled out of these afflictions. And I'm going to tell you how it comes. It comes because of the prayers of many. And Paul didn't say it was because of his holiness or because of his righteousness. He's speaking to broken vessels who are spending time in prayer for him. And he knows what's going on. He knows the answers to prayer. He knows the blessings of prayer that are coming because of the prayers of many. We want to know where our strength comes from. Boy, oh, you're not going to find a better verse. You must also help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Is prayer important? Amen. Is your prayer important? important. Amen. Are you one of the many? Yes. <laughs> You're not praying alone. That's right. so why we come together at 4.30 on Sunday. We're praying for this body of believers. That's right. And I believe God is answering prayers. Amen. Verse 12. For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience. He says, you know, I've I've got a, you've got a testimony in your conscience whether you're doing things right or not. You know that? You've got a testimony in your conscience. It's not only a testimony of your comfort, but God gives us a testimony of our experiences. And here he's had the testimony of their afflictions, the 
testimony of their deliverance. Now he's saying, I've got a testimony of our conscience that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and supremely so toward you. Verse 13, we're not writing to you anything other than what you read and understand and hope you'll fully understand, just as you did partially understand us. I mean, they were getting some of it. They didn't get all of it, but he's saying, I'm, you're getting some of it, and some of it's better than not getting any of it. I'm glad you're getting some of it. He says that on the day of our Lord Jesus, you will boast of us as we boast of you. He's saying, when the day of Jesus comes, he says, I'm going to be bragging on you because I'm proud of you. And you're going to be bragging on me because you're going to say thank you for what you helped do in my life. And we're going to be bragging and boasting on each other and saying, you know why we're here before Jesus? It's not because of just what I've done. It's because of what he's done. It's because of what Jesus did. And I'm going to tell you what, I lived a life, we lived a life among brothers and sisters who loved each other and kicked each other in the tail when we needed to be kicked. And said, get up. I know you're going through afflictions, but I'm going to tell you, I believe in you. I'm proud of you, and that's what I want to do. I want to stand in the day of Jesus, and I hope that you will want to do that, and we'll tell each other, I am proud of you. You could have sat at home. You could have gone and done your own thing, but I'm going to tell you, I'm proud of you because you let the Spirit of God work in you. I am proud of you that you take care of foster children. I am proud of you that you reach out to the homeless. I am proud of you that you greet people when they walk into this place. I am proud of you. And even in the midst of your afflictions, you can say the testimony of my conscience is I tried to do it right. Not on my strength, but on the strength that works in and through you through the power of Jesus Christ. I'm proud of you like a father see his son playing in sports and he didn't make the tackle but he still says that's my boy maybe he made the tackle maybe he made the point but maybe he missed it and he still says I'm proud of you I'm proud of you you're out there playing the game you're out there trying you haven't given up and if you're in this room you haven't given up and I am proud of you I am proud to be among you and with you. And we ought to be proud of each other. Amen. And we ought to hug each other and say, I am proud of you. Like a father and a mother holds their children and says, I'm boasting of you. You are mine and I am yours. And we together are going to have a testimony of God's comfort. Isn't that powerful? This is what the church is. This is what the church is supposed to be and how this testimony of, of our comfort arises from the ashes of things that we think have destroyed us and have afflicted us and hurt us. And I'm going to tell you the power of the Holy Spirit was sent to bring life to you. And each person, each person who has come to faith in Jesus Christ is going to be raised, raised to life again. We believe in the resurrection, don't you? Amen. We believe in the resurrection. Yes. And there's no greater symbol of the resurrection from the grave than baptism. Right. We're going to have a baptism today. Yes. Yes. And if there's anybody else here who wants to be baptized, it is a beautiful opportunity to do that. To say, yes, I've been afflicted. I have been hurt. I have felt pain and I need the comfort. And I'm going to tell you, the comfort that we will eventually have on this earth pales in comparison to the comfort we will experience with our Lord Jesus Christ at the resurrection, with our resurrected bodies. And I'm going to tell you, with resurrected bodies, there will be no more tears and there will be no more crying and there will be more, no more death. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do y'all really believe it? If we really believed it, if we really believed it, our lives will be changed. Amen. I really believe it. And I'm so glad to be among a body of people who believe it too. 
Dallas is going to come up here and, and sing a song while they get ready for a baptism. And it's important for us, it's important for us to have a testimony. The testimony may be of your conversion. The testimony may be of what God has done in your life. But I'm going to tell you, one of the strongest testimonies that you can ever have is the testimony of God's comfort that he's brought to you. Because I'm going to tell you, even unbelievers, especially unbelievers, they're hurting, aren't they? They just don't know where to find the solution. But God has given you an insight into that solution if we'll just spend some time giving them the testimony of your comfort because you serve the God of all comfort. Y'all stand with me, please. If you were going to have the elders who are here, and uh, I guess Floyd, I guess you'll come up. We've got um, buddies out there, and I'll come down here too. If you want prayers for your healings or for strength, feel free to do it. If the prayer partners can go over here, I'd like to spend some time with us praying together as a body of believers and loving each other and saying, and, nothing, and while we're doing that, there's still going to be nothing wrong with you turning to your neighbor and say, you know what, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. And let's start building each other up. Let's build each other up. You're a loving group of people, and let's keep doing it. And then after that, we're going to have a baptism.